Patience Anderson Faulkner. I was born in Cordoba. And my father was George Robert Anderson, and my mother was Eleanor Safry um, from Minnesota. Um, I have not always lived in Alaska, but um, I've been back in Alaska 42 years. We always start traditionally with our grandparents. Mm -hmm. My grandmother was from Tetitlik, and she had many children, and I shouldn't, I should know how many, but I don't. So I have many, many cousins that are in Cordova, Valdez, and Tetitlik. And many a time um, when I look on the family tree, I go, Oh, I guess I better be nicer. That's a cousin of mine. <laughs> Not be so critical or mean, but I'm related to quite a few. Most of Prince William Sound, oh, okay. and that surprised me when I um, when I got the family tree. But it's great. My father was, um, as I said, George Robert Anderson, and he was a fisherman and a logger and a fighter, uh, a boxer. And he lived his whole life here in um, Cordova. Um, but he, when he was married to my mother, they would go out to Sheep Bay and spend the summers out there when he was fishing. And I recall stories from my brothers that would talk about the um, wash bowls, basins, tubs of blueberries that she would pick. Oh my gosh. So, my mother is an avid gatherer to begin with. She always, what is out there from nature is for her. And she uses it wisely and she shares it, even to this day. I didn't and then I have a son, and um, he has a son, and I did have a daughter, but she passed away. Mm -hmm. So, and then, um, yeah, that's just about it. There's not too many more. Well, it sounds like you have a big family. Yes, it's a big family, yeah. There's, they're right there asking for gifts, <laughs> or with their hand out ready to accept one, I should say. That's why you're always working so hard <laughs> nonstop. Yeah. Yes, they do love those handmade gifts, don't they? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Patience, what inspired you as a child life? Well, as a child, being raised by feral Scandinavians mm -hmm. in Minnesota, I, um, those fa that side of the family were always working on something. They were knitting, they were crocheting, they were embroidering, mm -hmm. they were baking, they were, um, if they were so lucky as to afford um, paint by numbers, <laughs> they were doing, they were being creative, very busy all the time. And so the curiosity, of watching different relatives do different things, I went, ooh, one day I can afford to do that. And I remember one of the biggest inspirations happened to be when my Scandinavian grandmother brought her rags to a weaver, and she, the lady was weaving rugs. Mm -hmm. And I was fascinated by that. Mm -hmm. But at age six or seven, there was no one around. I mean, there was no one around doing it, no younger person. So there was no one to ask. And of course, there were no magazines. I couldn't read that well, but I was fascinated by it. So that curiosity about learning, number one, how to do the skill, number two, to repurpose, recycle, that has always been in my blood or, or mind. So from then, I whatever I could pick up here and there to grow to something I would do. Watch my grandmother knit, I watched my mother knit, and so so I knew that, yeah, we're supposed to be doing something, but to sit still and do it, no, I didn't do it. But I picked up, I t and, but I picked up more of the curiosity. Oh, yeah. And, how, and that, that has kept me awake many a night, the curiosity of a project. <laughs> From your perspective as a Native elder, what do you think is important for youth to know about creating traditional artwork or clothing from our region and why? I'm a firm believer that um, every one of our children should be able to make something, um, beaded earrings, mm -hmm. bracelets, maybe moccasins, very simple items because when they go off to college or vocational school or living on their own, all of a sudden they're an adult. 
they feel an obligation to have a gift for someone. They don't have 20 bucks. Mm -hmm. I mean, money is tight, but if they had, could make a pair of earrings, $5 worth of earring, you know, and they could have a $25 gift. So, or if they got in a tight spot where they wanted to um, save money for a down payment on a car or something, mm -hmm. they could be utilizing this skill to make money, you know, just to supplement. Because we have more free time than we realize. And if you've got a goal in mind, the second job doesn't help. But but maybe making, you know, five bucks worth of jewelry stuff, you can get a lot of money. Uh, it goes a long ways. Plus, I have learned uh, in my older age now, there aren't enough hours in the day or in my life left for me to be able to perfect some of the skills that I'd like to perfect. I'm really more of a cheerleader to get people to um, to do, do things, to encourage them and, and try and make opportunities for them to sell or, or share or give them ideas. I'm a cheerleader. I mean, it took us, all of us, a long time to feel confident enough to teach. Um, so the, the saying, when the student is ready, the teacher will be there. So I, for the next years, I just kept admiring beadwork, and there wasn't a lot around, not much in Cordoba. But you'd go, I would go to AFN or see natives in Anchorage when I was going to school. And I'd look at it and I'd say, gosh, I'd love to be able to do that. But, but I had to go to a non-native that had a bead store here in Cordova. At bottom line was nag her into teaching. And all I needed was to get a few things, terminologies, no internet those days, but get the terminologies of what kind of needles I needed, what kind of beads I needed, and then a couple of skills, and then, oh, there's beading magazines. Didn't know that. I got going on that, and all I needed was, I think I ended up paying for three different techniques from her, just because I, it would move me along faster. Right. And from then on, I mean, I teach them all. You know, I can teach them in my sleep. So when I finally was able to um, be introduced to elders at the time that would let me in their house, mm -hmm. and I think 40 pounds of fried bread and tea later, um, which is over the years, or maybe <laughs> one afternoon. But anyway, um, I was able to um, instill some confidence from the elders that I wasn't trying to take drain their mind of their cultural history, yeah. but I was seriously concerned and interested. Yeah. And it took many, many, many months of developing this friendship and that it was a true friendship. I mean, I wasn't just coming there to have tea and fried bread and drain their brain. If you needed some help, you needed to ride somewhere, if you needed something, you need to bake something. You know, it was a, I hope it was a two-way street. Yeah. It wasn't one way. And I developed friendships that were very dear, and they've since passed away, but very dear and very helpful. Mm -hmm. And I was, with elders, be, I'm surprised, you know, sometimes this one elder would invite me. Every time she had fried bread, <laughs> she'd invite me, <laughs> call me up. And wherever I worked, they knew I was going for fried bread. They don't care what was going on. Go get the fried bread. <laughs> to, have, be, to have that kind of relationship really took a, long, a lot of work. And I had to develop a lot of trust. Yeah. And I would ask some questions. What kind of things did we do before whatever? At that time, I didn't know that um, much about the boarding schools. I didn't know much about the, the um, federal law that um, created the, the non-native school and the native school. I didn't know about the, that there wasn't any a sufficient amount of health monies. I mean, there were so many things. I was, I was skipping rope in life and didn't know about it. But once I started talking to the elders on different things, I started picking up. And then um, I later became the executive director for the Native Village of Biak. And the burden was put on me, and it was pretty heavy. And I went, I got to give some education here. I mean, I'm a smart girl, but 
I, I mean, there were no resources, no, no books, no magazines, no online. We barely had long distance telephone. I mean, it was early days. Yeah. And so I did go to a law school and picked it up and argued <laughs> the first whatever it is. And the professors, of course, who were fabulous, got me on the Native American thinking a way to, which is different from a, different from the non-native part of the United States. Mm -hmm. Different laws, and they're applied in different manners. Did you have to overcome any obstacles on your path to becoming an expert in your field? Well, the the obstacles I had first of all was to, um, because my brothers were living, they weren't hunting. Mm -hmm. I have provided, this is how silly it is, I, having to learn Alaska Native culture, learn it, have provided every one of my brothers with a sea otter pelt. I'm going, okay, what's wrong with this picture? <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and I also have any, uh, I made drums for all of them. I mean, now, just recently, my brother Tom gifted me with a carved, um, wall spoon type of thing really oh, cool beautiful. beautiful you know so he he is and he's older than I am he is loosening up his he's very talented I just wish go out in the garage and keep making don't yeah. be don't watch TV keep yeah. making but he's loosening up freeing himself you know but he can do this and it's okay and I think I've always had the freedom of um, being able to do that, or I pushed mm -hmm. it, mm -hmm. or maybe I'm contrary and saying, you can't tell me I can't do that. <laughs> I'm going to do it. Exactly. It'll be done. And that's why, as I said earlier, I cheerlead. Mm -hmm. Take the mystery out of, I, mean, I always teach keychains first. Mm -hmm. The reason is, number one, if you follow my instructions, you end up with a pretty nice keychain. But you earn, learn how to do the edge. Mm -hmm. and. The next project is an amulet bag mm -hmm. or a, key, or a, some, a scissor case around the edge. Same mm -hmm. thing, but different end product. Right. The reason I do the keychains is, number one, you're going to give it to your dad. Mm -hmm. He's going to put it in his pocket, and it's going to wear out in a year. So the ugly on it will be gone, <laughs> you know, it, but it'll be usable. Yeah. It'll be usable, and your dad will be very happy about it. Yeah. But And then the other things are more for show and to use. So you want to have your work a little bit better. But you will have learned so much. And then I, then I go on to the bead embroidery and, and um, some earrings and, mm -hmm. you know, oh. grow from it. Teach, grow different steps of success. So do you have any advice for students who may be interested in learning about their culture and artwork from their region? Well, participate in events. Mm -hmm. The one event that really is a showcase for culture, um, and you have to look deeper than the, the, the sobriety celebration, uh, go participate in that from the beginning to the end. And if you get, connect with the right people that are gonna be there from beginning to end, you get the behind the scenes mm -hmm. stuff. Okay. I mean, offer to help Jackie with the elders thing, but also I can always use help in the art and craft area because I get to meet so many good people yeah. and I get to talk to so many good people. Mm -hmm. But don't just be a bystander. Mm -hmm. Ask. Okay. Now, I check um, everywhere I go and I see the young native kids mm -hmm. here in Cordova and I don't drive around a lot, but I'll see them at the um, coffee shop or mm -hmm. grocery store. I'll ask them, what are you making, mm -hmm. you know? And they'll tell me and I'll say, well, you know, we meet on Thursday night if you want to come learn something or I'm willing to do it. Um, I just remind them of where they can connect constantly. And I met a ton of friends. So I'm a very rich person. Well, Can't ask for anything more. Well,